the test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear two people discussing an extramural course. Fill in the information you hear on the application form below. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now, here is the conversation. Hi, Jenny. What are you doing down here? Oh, hello, Steve. Well, I'm trying to fill in this form, but I'm having a bit of a struggle as I sprained my wrist playing tennis yesterday. Don't worry. I'll do it for you. Let's have your pen. Right, fire away. Mm, let's see. I want to do the drama and theatre studies. I'd like to get the certificate. The course number is uh, 60201. No, sorry, 202. It seems to be on Thursday at 7.30. Yes, well, we don't have to put all that down. Now, I suppose we can call you Miss. Don't be funny. And spell my name right. Hmm. Well, if you'll have a name like Jenny McPherson... Let's see, it's M-A-C. No, big M, small c, no A. Right, M-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N. Yes, OK, and don't forget it's a capital P, Macpherson. Now, what's your address? Well, I've just moved, so it's 6 Westway Avenue, Longford. Hang on, don't go so fast. 6 Westway Avenue, where? Longford. What's next? Your phone number, daytime and evening. Well, I've only got one, as we can't have calls at school in the daytime, so put down the evening one. 605-4829. 4829, OK. And you're a teacher. How old are you? 29? Mmm, wish I were. No, 32. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do they want my date of birth? No, don't seem to, just age. Uh, how about educational qualifications? Well, I've got a degree in English literature and a diploma in media studies. Media studies, right. Now, have you ever done any of these extramural courses before? No, don't think so although I did do something on psychodrama once. But no, it wasn't extramural, was it? That seems to be it, except for the fee. Yes, well, that's the same for all the central courses. I think £25. I suppose I have to include it with this form. <laughs> Looks like it. Uh, do you want me to write the cheque out for you? But uh, you'll have to sign it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a message left to John on how to look after the house. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, John. Welcome to the house. I'm really pleased that you can be here to look after my house while I'm away. Here are some things you need to know about the house. Important stuff like when the garbage is collected. In fact, let's start with the garbage, which is collected on Friday. Just write garbage on the calendar on the days they take it away. Put it out on Friday every week. That'll be Friday the 22nd, Friday the 29th, and Friday the 5th. It's a really good service. The trucks are quiet and the service is efficient. The bin would be put outside of the house empty. It's a good idea to put it away quickly. This street can be quite windy. I once watched my next-door neighbour chase her bin the whole length of the street. Every time she nearly caught up with it, it got away again. The waste paper will be collected this Tuesday. That's Tuesday the 19th. There's a plastic box full of paper in the front room. Please put it out on Tuesday. The truck will come during the day. If you don't mind collecting old newspapers and other paper and putting them in the box, I'll put it out when I come home. The paper people only come monthly. I have some things to give to charity in a box in the front room. Would you put it out on Monday the 25th, please? It's a box of old clothes and some bed linen which I've collected, plus a few other bits and pieces. The charity truck will come by during the day on the last Monday of the month. Like the paper people, it comes monthly. If you want to use the library, you'll find it on Darling Street. I've left my borrower's card near the telephone. It has a very good local reference section if you want to find out more about this city. The library is open from 9am to 5pm, Monday to Saturday. I'm sorry to say that we don't have a cleaner. Oh yes, filters. Would you please change the filters on the washing machine on the last week of the month, no matter which day? We find that the machine works much better if we change the filters regularly. The gas company reads the meter on the 30th, the last Saturday. I think that's all the information about our calendar of events. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Well, John, I'm trying to think what else I should be telling you. As you know, I'm going to a conference in London. I hope to have a little time to look around. It's a great city. I do hope I manage to get at least some of the theatres and museums. I'm looking forward to all the things I have to do at the conference, too. I'm giving a paper on Tuesday the 26th, and there are a couple of exciting events planned later in the conference programme. I hope to meet up with an old teacher of mine at the conference. She taught English literature at my high school, and we've kept in touch through letters over the years. She now teaches at the University of Durham, and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. By the way, I expect you're hungry after your trip. I've left a meal in the refrigerator for you. I hope you like cheese and onion pie. Would you do me a favour, please? I haven't had time to cancel an appointment. It was made a long time ago, and I forgot about it until this morning. It's with my dentist for a checkup on Thursday the 28th. Could you please call the dentist on 8162-525 and cancel the appointment for me? Thanks a lot, John. One last thing. When you leave the house, make sure the windows and doors are shut and set the burglar alarm. The alarm code number is 9120. Have fun. I'll see you when I get back. This is your friend Martha saying goodbye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a lecturer talking to a group of science students. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the science faculty. As you may know, my field of study is neurobiology, so you may be wondering what I have to say to those of you who are studying physics or chemistry or geology, even those of you who intend to become doctors. In fact, what I have to say is aimed especially at those who wish to enter the medical profession, though the main point applies to all of you. And what is my main point? Basically, it is that you shouldn't get stuck in too narrow a specialization. What I mean is, too often doctors and scientists become experts on one small aspect of their subject and neglect the rest. Perhaps you have heard the joke about a doctor being introduced to another doctor as an expert on the nose. Oh, yes, said the other doctor. Which nostril? I know that more and more it is necessary to specialize, because when you finish your studies, you have to find a place in the job market. But I do believe that it is damaging both to you personally and to the profession. You may be surprised to know how many physicians in the past were men of wide culture. Many were interested in the humanities, from the arts to literature to philosophy. A surprising number of them, from Rabelais to William Carlos Williams, became poets, novelists, and playwrights. Men of science have written clearly and intelligently about society, psychology, and politics. This tradition is not dead. Today, such eminent scientists as Stephen Jay Gould, Jared Diamond, and Richard Dawkins are well known as popularizers of science while maintaining high standards. But more of them in a minute. I'm not saying that while you are studying anatomy, you should sign up for a course in English literature, but reading a few works of fiction in your own time will show you the human mind, just as your anatomy classes show you the human body. Science faculties and medical schools, it seems to me, now largely ignore this human dimension. Furthermore, the study of medicine, and psychology for that matter, is largely about what has gone wrong with the body and the mind. That is, it mostly deals with the abnormal. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So, to try and correct this situation, if only in a small way, I have come up with some extra reading for you to do. Don't worry. I wouldn't have chosen them if I didn't think they were enjoyable as well as interesting. The first on my list I'm sure you've all heard of, even if you haven't read it, it's Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. Now, don't turn your noses up at it just because it's now officially a school book and is written to entertain as well as inform. In fact, I've found it a very good bedside book. Next come a couple of the writers I mentioned earlier. 
Any collection of essays by Stephen Jay Gould is worth reading. He writes clearly in a language non-scientists can easily understand. In fact, a lot of his essays are responses to questions about science from the general public. He's also entertaining on the subject of baseball. Perhaps you should start with Gould's Wonderful Life. He writes brilliantly about natural history and shows how much imagination and excitement there is in scientific discovery. Then there's Jared Diamond's The Rise and Fall of the Third Chimpanzee, which shows us how close we are to the apes and forces us to look at some of the darker aspects of human nature. After reading it, you won't forget your animal ancestry, but don't let that put you off. It's very readable. You're probably saying to yourselves, "Just a minute. These are all science books." What about the fiction? I'll come to those in a later lecture. At the moment, I'm just trying to get you to read away from your chosen field of study. However, I will recommend one work of fiction now, though it might come as a bit of a surprise. If it does, it means you haven't read it. The book is *The Water Babies* by Charles Kingsley. I can see I have surprised you. Well, it is in fact the first fictional response to Charles Darwin's *On the Origin of Species*. Yes, it is a children's book, but full of surreal fantasy and wit. The fourth, no, the fifth book on the list is a biography, *The Emperor of Scent* by Chandler Burr. To my mind, it's not particularly well written, but it is a fascinating story. It is about Luca Turin, a biophysicist who becomes an expert on perfume, and about how he missed getting the Nobel Prize. If any of you are thinking of a career in scientific research, this book might make you think again. It's a very tough dog-eat-dog -dog business, which brings us to the book that inspired Kingsley's. Water Babies, that classic of the genre, Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. If you haven't read it already, perhaps you shouldn't be here. If you have, it won't hurt to read it again. Or if you prefer, read his The Voyage of the Beagle, which, as well as being of interest to any natural historian or anyone interested in scientific method, also makes a great travel book. Well, I think that's enough to be going on with, and I can see that it's time to finish up. So please bear in mind, throughout whatever course you are studying, not to neglect other aspects of your wider non-academic education. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator, giving advice on how to get your first job or commission as an artist. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five.
I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student you're pushed along by fellow students and tutors and the driving force is there. However, when you leave college you find yourself saying things like I'll have one more cup of coffee and then I'll sit down to work. <laughs> I, I hate to admit it but I say it myself. Suddenly it isn't finding the inspiration or getting the right paper that's a problem. It's you. In my view, there are a number of reasons why this happens. It's a real challenge making a decent living as a new artist. You have to find a market for your work. Often you work freelance and need to take samples or portfolios of your work from place to place. These experiences are common to a lot of professional people. But artists also have to bear their souls to the world, in a way. More than anything, they want praise. If people don't like what they create, then it can be a very emotional and upsetting experience hearing them say this. I began to realise that these problems were preventing me from having a career in art. And so I decided to experiment. I was a painter but I started to dabble in illustration, drawing pictures for books, cards, and this offered me the opportunity to become more emotionally detached from my work. I was no longer producing images from the heart, but developing images for a specified subject, taking a more practical approach. I began to develop a collection of my illustrations which I put into a portfolio and started to carry around with me to show prospective clients and employers. But it was still tricky because publishers, for example, want to know that your drawings will reproduce well in a book. But without having had any work published, it's hard to prove this. Having a wonderful portfolio or a collection of original artwork is of course a first step. But what most potential clients would like to see is printed artwork, and without this evidence, they tend to hold back still when it comes to offering a contract. Look at questions 36 to 40. Now answer questions 36 to 40. Well, I overcame this problem in two ways. <clears throat> and I, I suppose this is my advice to you on preparing your portfolio of your best work. The first way was by submitting my work for a competition. And the one I chose was for a horoscope design and was sponsored by a top women's magazine. There are a few of these competitions each year, and they offer new illustrators an opportunity to showcase their work. The other approach I took was to design and print some mock-up pages of a book. In other words, I placed some of my illustrations next to some text in order to demonstrate how my work would look when it was printed. <laughs> Perhaps I was lucky in that I, I had taken a degree that provided me with all-round creative skills so that I could vary my style and wasn't limited to a certain technique. Now, I think that is important. The art world and many other creative fields do try to pigeonhole people into snug boxes with an accompanying label. Now, I think you should try to resist this if you feel it happening to you. If you don't... You'll find it difficult to have new work accepted if you try to develop your style at a later stage in your career. Nevertheless, when you start out, and particularly when you're going for an interview, it's important not to confuse people by having a lot of different examples in your portfolio. 
One remedy for this is to separate your work into distinct categories. In my case, I did this by dividing my design-inspired illustrations from my paintings. It's then easier to analyse the market suited to each portfolio, such as magazines, book jackets, CD covers, etc. Working under two names is also useful, as it clarifies the different approaches and offers a distinction between them. I think it's been hard for artists to be recognised in anything other than the pigeonholes that they've been placed in. But luckily, these barriers are slowly being demolished. So I really do wish you all success. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.